Hello everyone, today we talk about the Roman-Germanic relations between the 4th and the 6th century, um, obviously AD. Um, this video is meant to be a sort of an introductory video to the period, to the, mm, to the migration period, let's say, um, broadly meant. Um, I won't discuss, you know, the in, in depth um, the, the causes of migration era. I will just try to stick to how the Romans dealt with the Germans and what we call uh, as Germans, telling the truth. And, um, and, and for the few that we know, uh, vice versa, in the sense, what were actually the Germans doing uh, in the lands of the Empire, how they, they uh, related themselves to the imperial power, the imperial authority, and also we will t discuss, generally speaking, the which I think it's very important to understand this period, the, um, the actual strategical control that the empire had over these populations, what it meant um, to have borders, a frontier uh, at this time, because people, I think, don't, don't get it very, um, very clear. Um, and this is probably what I want to, to start discussing from, because between the uh, 4th and 6th century, um, as you know, the, um, the there is. Um, I, I should address you maybe to, to some um, to some video I made about migration era to to give you a bit of background because there are many things that I, I won't be repeating today. Um, the um, I made a video about the uh, beginning of the migration era. That um, it's it's definitely a good one, and the title is uh, is the is the one we we told. Um, I discussed also um, Schitzens and Sarmatians at the roots of migration era. That also broadly contemplates um, these populations, movements. Um, also, who were the Huns? Um, oh no, wait, uh, that was uh, relatively... that can be interesting, but about the Huns, really how the Huns transformed the migration era, because there is a stage from which things were um, roughly controlled by the Romans, then eventually when the Huns moved west from the Eurasian steppes, a lot actually changed, and that's what uh, brought the crisis in the management of the Roman frontiers. So, <coughs> I've made enough, let's say, uh, for you to, to go look at that if you're interested. Um, so, as you, however, we, I, I, I guess, um, Everybody knows these between these centuries there were several peoples from the Eurasian steppes that essentially reversed um, uh, they they used to to migrate actually on their own i mean the the migration era relatively to the mm, uh, movements of people didn't really contemplate just the idea of settling to the Roman Empire where these people found fertile land that had not been ravaged and uh, um, usually places from which other peoples had moved, maybe for other reasons, maybe because they had found good opportunities if they were, were lucky because the, the average was really fleeing <laughs> um, from, uh, from an enemy that was stronger than you, it could eventually um, uh, absorb you into its um, dominions if you if you had stayed longer. Um, so, however, the, the Roman Empire was um, substantially this safe harbor that most of these populations, especially the ones, the, prob the pro properly mm, Germanic ones, um, that were more Romanized, and because they knew the empire since, mm, you know, since a very long time, uh, from a very long time, and um, they, they still considered the, the empire is a sort of bulwark, paradoxically, against the same threats that they were suffering, chiefly the Huns, because the Germans were more or less, I mean, they were um, part of, um, they had gravitated around the empire. You can't say they were part of the empire, but definitely they, they were subjected to it uh, to a certain extent. We will discuss this um, in a while. For now, um, the uh, the important thing is that um, 
the the reason why these populations eventually began to settle into the empire is that of which the empire was not very happy indeed because it had always happened actually that populations were um, welcomed practically by the Romans within um, their own borders um, but they they had been smaller groups that were very easy to Romanize very easy to um, to to maintain subjected and and it was completely normal for ancient standards I mean the Romans had a particularly sophisticated integration um, uh, system. The, the Romans actually built their own empire and they made, and were able to make it sense so long exclusively because they integrated um, uh, the, the, the subjugated peoples at the point of progressively mailing, mailing, making participating uh, to, the, to the imperial government in practice as Romans, not as barbarians, um, as Roman citizens. Uh, but what occurred substanti substantially from the um, from the fourth and especially the fifth century onwards is that um, the Romans couldn't hold such a big mass of population anymore. Um, the main reason is um, it's not really about the amount of these populations, really, because um, first of all, the demographic strengths of these peoples. At the time, was uh, remarkable, but it wasn't this big, big deal. It was, um, it wasn't really a human tide. Um, the, the problem was the other way around, if anything. That is essentially that the empire went depopulated, uh, chiefly during the uh, third century crisis, um, because of factors that chiefly involved um, uh, infighting between the Romans. Probably also certain climatic changes might have occurred, but in a mild way. But what is important really is that the third century uh, creates a, co um, a shortage of resources, also in terms of manpower for the army. So uh, you have to really have to think about the, the the poverty of the ancient world. Sometimes we picture the the ancient world, the Roman Empire, with a degree of social complex complexity that is even superior to, the, I don't know, certain parts of the modern age. This is completely false. Um, Europe, you have to think of ancient of the ancient world as something um, essentially not superior, at least in my opinion, to 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 the to the thirteenth century Western Europe, and th that starts to be substantially more advanced uh, than than the Romans in this sense. Um, there were certain, obviously, the, there, are, there were certain things for which the ancient world was more advanced, even than, than certain. But it, it isn't really about a, an absolute scale of, of, of judgment. It's really about mm, certain things that, that happened for certain con contingent reasons that maybe made the Roman Empire more developed in, under a certain point of view on something uh, relatively to the... Uh, to, to certain years of the Middle Ages, but um, there is a reason for that. If you look at the, the, the potential of ancient economy, that wasn't really big much. And and wars like the ones that afflicted the Empire during the third century, mostly civil wars, dev really devastated the, um, the Empire's resources. It is true that during the third century were also um, um, certain peoples, um, from um, outside the borders that began to make raids into the empire. Some of them were actually also pretty big because this is something that starts happening, telling the truth, from the second half of the second century AD. There is um, something messy, especially happening in Germany, that we can't really focus, um, which remains relatively blurred, um, because we don't know much about these populations. They didn't write. Uh, the Roman authors weren't excessively interested in, in them at, um, at that point, but in, there is a sort of order that kind of collapses. There is a crisis for which these populations begin to, to, to start pushing on the borders of the empire. When um, the imperial borders are left uncovered because there is civil war between the same Romans, um, emperors overthrown, revolts, and all. Uh, that were actually aimed at controlling the heart of the empire, so not really the um, 
the frontier areas that were usually poor, mm, aside from maybe some regions in um, in Mesia or, um, or probably part of Gaul, parts of Gaul, of, of, of Gaul the, the, the frontier er areas of the empire were substantially, um, they had a, a low economical potential. But the you know when when the the in this sense the Romans lowered the guard as it happens in all times in history when there are big crises of great empires this happened to the Carolingians it happened to the Chinese before um, it it was something that is normal that is uh, brigandage um, piracy and and, and this uh, raiding incursions start to take place so really much of the reason why these populations also came to to harass the borders of the empire was um, the 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 weakness of the mm, let's say previous weakness of the empire not the fact that they weakened actively the empire also because they were basically kicked out all the times. So there were something really um, um, counting on the speed of these incursions that had a strictly military nature. What starts happening from the 4th century onwards is something completely different. It's really world, the world peoples that basically are asking the Romans to let them in. Because they're being pushed away, that they don't have um, land anymore, they're literally starving to death, and they need to be accepted. And the interesting thing about this is that the Romans actually uh, had a benefit in in letting these people in in, in a controlled number because these populations could uh, refill those um, uh, let's say mm, those areas that had been depopulated and to transform these settlers into essentially Roman uh, colons. Uh, which is what they did. I mean, the first barbarians were integrated, were essentially split. Uh, they, they didn't survive as tri single tribes. They were essentially absorbed as peasantry um, into areas that maybe had a certain, maybe ethnic prevalence of these populations, but were still under the Roman uh, administration. Were still uh, also in, into the property of some of some people, some time, um, some Roman own landowners. Um, some of these pop of of these mm, so-called barbarians were also bought as slaves. Uh, that were um, present in very high numbers because of the wars that were being fought between the same barbarians. So, as it always happens, slavery is very rarely something that happens by conquering the land and deporting the people as slaves. The Romans did that, but m th the greatest part of slaves that actually flowed into the empire came from trade, mm, and it, say, it was a much more capillar way to do that. Also because the wars of expansion of the empire at this point had kind of stopped. Um, even previously th they weren't so frequent, so uh, and the Romans couldn't rely just on slaves that they, they, they took while conquering other nations. Um, also because these nations usually, if they were conquered by empire, were preferably left where they were. And, and and the best thing the Romans could do to control those lands was essentially to co-opt the uh, local elites uh, and to, to, to rule over those peoples through those elites that eventually got Romanized and became Romans in, in turn. Um, so something that, as always, the people, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, um, you don't have to think of the Romanization as a happy process but definitely was something of great um, of great advancement for the time because essentially a also other great empires function in this way if you really look in detail but the Romans and this had um, a greater mm, I don't know how to say that but they were pretty skilled at doing that they it's something that they started to to do since an early age and today we will talk also about the so-called federati that uh, the Fedus, which means alliance um, or pact, is something very ancient in Roman history. We we often talk about the Federati as the um, you know as this late uh, sage of Roman history, but actually um, the Federatio, the the Fedus, was uh, something uh, that remained uh, throughout all Roman history, at least in the the ancient period. Um, 
as the normal, let's say, um, form of um, uh, the normal relation that the Roman government had towards the populations that it came to to to, to rule on. So, um, who were these barbarians anyway? Um, I use the term barbarian not in the sense that the Greeks and uh, especially the Greeks and the Romans used um, uh, but really we t today in historiography we preferred there was a time like in the 70s in, in into which historiography said oh these were Germanic peoples so let's, let's call them Germanic because barbarian is offensive today we came back to call them barbarians because essentially we realized that these populations were really Germanic uh, broadly speaking, we um, we will deal with this later for now. But just let's say that there were much more, m much m many more ethnicities that also blended w together with this um, Germanic population. So today we prefer to uh, instead of saying Germanic, Sarmatian, um, Iranic, um, Turkic, and all uh, Proto-Slavic, etc. We prefer to say. Mm, barbarian, because it's it, it's still an ethnic definition, if you want. Um, the, um, in the, the 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 term barbaros comes from um, barbarian comes from the Greek barbaros, which is a term that basically is uh, has a very negative exception, um, uh, a very negative value in the Greek um, in classical Greece, because the the Greeks were um, were very um, proud of themselves to the point of feeling com of their civilization, f feeling contempt about whoever wasn't a Greek. Basically, everybody who was not a Greek wa was a barbarian, and and whoever you know was advanced enough was considered a sort of honorary Greek. Even the Romans, at a point when were were invited <laughs> to the to the Olympiads by saying okay let, let's take the Romans in because they definitely thought that were barbaric but um, they they still you know, recognized as a sort of an advanced civilization um, the Romans had telling the truth a very different um, concept of the term uh, barbarian the Romans mm, had the term barbarus, which was essentially this um, Latinization of the Greek term. Uh, by the way, barbarus seems to be an onomatopoeic name that, um, like barbar, would be the, the kind of sound that the um, uh, the the Greeks were uh, um, essentially um, uh, mimicking, mocking. Um, um, relatively to the uh, how the, the, these foreign populations uh, used to speak, so something incomprehensible and all. The Romans um, really, as we have seen, weren't uh, because the great difference between the Greeks and the Romans is that the Greeks didn't want to integrate anyone. The Greeks were Greeks were proud of their citizenship; they didn't want to extend it to anyone, and that's how they lost everything in practice. Um, to the Romans, who instead extended definitely, as we've seen, the citizenship through various stages. Obviously, the Romans were not this extremely multi, um, let's say, open-minded society that liked every foreigner at all. Actually, the Romans were pretty traditionalist on their own. But they had found out that the only way to rule over a large empire that was the one they wanted to, to build was to um, integrate these populations. and progressively Romanizing them and eventually make them full Romans. So at the time of the Empire, when Rome uh, ruled over um, really many populations, also very different um, ethnic and um, backgrounds, they um, and, and they had built the Empire that you have to imagine for that time that, um, let's say at the time of Augustus, Rome had de facto conquered the world. It is true that the Romans knew that there was India, that there was China. Um, they didn't know there were other parts of the world that were even closer to them, like Russia, for instance, um, because the geographical knowledge was very different from what we had now. But objectively, if you have an empire that stretches from Scotland to, to, to the Indian Ocean, to the Persian Gulf, 
you, uh, I mean, in ancient perspectives, I mean, now we know it, today we know we, we're, we're grown old with, with satellite maps and all these things, but at those times, that was the world. I mean, the Romans had really conquered the world. Therefore, the ideology that they had built had really um, shifted the meaning of, of barbarian, um, at least in the Latin um, in the Latin sense, because in, the, in, in Greece, actually, the Greeks kept living into the Roman Empire as if the Roman Empire did not exist. They, they practically uh, were so much um, in love with their own civilization that they, they didn't... Um, they didn't, r they didn't accept the fact that they had been conquered, practically, and, and the Romans actually l left them pretty dwelling pretty pretty well, because after all, the empire had very low taxation compared to, to other times in history. Uh, mm, there was a large degree of autonomy in, into the Roman Empire, which is something that people often overlook, and it's, it's not really much about the Roman so suppose uh, alleged Roman tolerance, which is, is also uh, it would be something very important to discuss, because tolerance, as we meant it today, didn't exist at all, nor in the ancient world, nor in the Middle Ages. There was simply it simply derived from the fact that it was impossible to really control with iron fists everywhere, because it, it it required an amount of resources that, um, say, pre-industrial societies didn't have. So the Romans definitely had this huge army that served the purpose of keeping, you know, the populations at bay. But um, the real mm, presence of the Roman Empire wasn't so oppressive as uh, as one thinks. It was really the same aristocracies that ruled uh, for uh, on behalf of the empire that really kept the world thing oppressed together with the, the support of the Roman legions that could intervene uh, when there was need. But besides this, what I was saying is that the Romans developed a different conception of, of barbarity, let's say, that the Greeks, the Greeks took, um, say, they, they got Romanized in part as well, so that if you look at Byzantine history, you realize that there was this half and half, you know, there was still the barbarian term was used both in the Roman and in, in the Greek meaning, but the Roman meaning at this point was that the barbarous wasn't really a negative term, as someone actually thinks. Uh, there was a lot of contempt, obviously, for these um, uncivilized populations, essentially, from the Roman perspective. Um, but uh, the Roman mind was that, um, you know, wherever there is a people that is uncivilized, Rome has to civilize that, <laughs> uh, in the sense that it has to conquer it and has at least to extend its power on it. And, and these populations can eventually grow to be part of the empire and pay taxes and making the empire larger and all. So this was really the Roman mindset. So the barbarous actu term actually had this, uh, say, even positive term of the good savage, you know, uh, that in anthropology is this idea of that, you know, the, the primitive cultures are somehow more positive, more genuine, more, um, they're kind of romantic, which is a kind of very stupid thing to say, because actually um, primitive cultures can be, are primitive because they, they, they would like to be very, you know, they don't have the resources to grow to be something more. So it's not really that they do that because they're good, but the Romans had, all, the Romans were complicated, actually. I mean, on certain things were very s simple, but the Romans had also this um, conception that they felt a bit themselves as barbarians. I mean, I historically speaking, that their um, their inclusive perspective came derived from a sort of a sort of an hybrid nature of their own um, city. You know, Rome was a city on the polis models of the Greeks, but. Um, just formally, de facto, it, it still remained a sort of tribal place um, uh, in um, in political ter in terms of political organization, and and and, and the, the same Romans had come from a a mix of populations, mostly Italic, but they had always been inclusive since the very early beginning. So th there had never been in Rome a 
a lineage that had that ethnicity that was the ruling one. No, the Romans were born from Latins, Sabine, Sabines, Etruscans, um, as, as, as um, I mean, in terms of when Rome was founded. And from there on, every pop population that they found, first in Italy, then into Europe and all, they, they integrated it. Um, so the, the Barbarus was, in the Roman mind, this kind of um, ideal state that had to be <laughs> had to be the precondition for romanization in a sort of sense the romans were terrible in the sense that it, it's very um it's also very fascinating to reason in that fashion um and the glory of rome actually stood not in exterminating barbarians but in integrating them mm -hmm. uh and this was the great dream also of of um um, of Hellenistic influence, I mean the idea of not even needing to take the sword against the people because the people would subject to yourself without even uh, resisting. Uh, this is something that existed since uh, at the time of Alexander the Greek uh, that was never met in practice because there was always someone who was uh, struggling uh, and, and resisted not to be conquered. But um, the the concept is that the, the, the ecumenic empire, as these uh, Romans were conceiving it, um, had to contemplate a sort of human uh, harmony, you know. The, the, the major glory of the empire was the pacification, the so-called the so Pax Romana, so this thing that was all but a um, a happy world in practice, like in any other world at that time, because um, you know it, it was a it was terrible living in those times. It doesn't matter, but that still, however, had something more because definitely a unitary empire that controlled a huge amount of places was um, definitely um, an imposition, but at the same time prevented. For instance, the European continent to, to, to keep fighting as it had happened for millennia before within tribes and had brought a sort of pacification into some form of wealth flowed in and, and could, you know, sensibly better the, the life of the populations that lived in there. This chiefly happened for, for the peoples that were dwelling in the cities. The countrysides weren't really... Um, that mm, better, probably on the contrary, the Romans brought um, uh, new forms of land exploitation that definitely that sensibly worsened the 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 average Iron Age peasant uh, lifestyle conditions. But um, these are very speculative um, speculative um, theories. I, I I don't want to talk about it, but I'm just offering you these details just to let you think that there is a bit more than the usual, you know, the, the Romans were good or the Romans were bad. The, that was an extremely complex world and uh, very, also very different in its parts, so it's very important. So these barbarians from the Roman side were basically all those populations that were extraneous to their model of civilization. It was essentially a sedentary civilization economically based on the cities, um, and consequently, mm, you know, mm, dominated by, by um, uh, an elite whose culture contemplated at that time a high degree of, um, um, let's say, intellectual development in terms of um, knowledge of history, literature, philosophy, that often were all in one uh, thing, science for, for what science meant at the time. Um, so, um, definitely a different model from these populations that were m mostly semi-nomadic, they didn't know urbanism, um, and definitely were uh, illiterate. Uh, and many other differences that the stem that actually come from, from, from this as a consequence. Um, the, um, um, the, um, Relative to the term German that we were stressing before, uh, this is also a very important thing that you want to know mm, as an in for an introduction to to this period and to the Roman Germanic relation. And today, um, as we were saying before, Germans is is a term that has been kind of rejected now by historiography because 
there was a, a much higher degree of, of, of multi-ethnicity in those populations. But more than else, what it's being stressed is that essentially the Germans, so these populations that dwell essentially from, from between the south of Scandinavia and the river Main, uh, or the Danube at this time, um, and between the Rhine and roughly the Elbe, um, and beyond actually at this time, because the, the, the Germans were also uh, migrating east um, in there, uh, the Germans had essentially come down f southwards toward from Scandinavia. The rest of Central Europe initially was Celtic. Then eventually the Germans were much more warlike than the Celts, eventually pushed these guys away or blended with them, but th they mostly dominated them. So the, the Romans had contained the Germanic migrations, actually had stopped them because they were trying to enter into Gaul. And Caesar went there and he kicked them out back to the Rhine. So the, the Germans actually stopped and they, 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 they realized that the empire was too, too big to be um, too strong uh, at that time, at least in the first two centuries of the empire to be, th or three centuries of the empire to be mm, invaded. And as we've said, they weren't uh, even conceiving of destroying them at all. They, they, they appreciated, they, they felt to be superior to the Romans, but they definitely enjoyed the Roman lifestyle and they, 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 and they highly appreciated Roman civilization. They didn't want to destroy it. This is very important also to bear in mind. Differently from other populations that still didn't want to destroy the empire because it was a kind of a, a fat uh, cow to crop, uh, to milk, sorry, but uh, <coughs> Excuse me, I drink a little. But we didn't know how to, to, to settle in there. We were talking, chi talking chiefly about the fully nomadic populations like the Huns. Mm. The Germans were semi-nomadic, but essentially they, they liked the idea uh, of living in the, in the empire, and that's what they went doing, practically settling down into these um, formerly Roman regions at that point. Uh, but the problem is that it's been stressed historiographically that these populations didn't really have a Germanic identity. I mean, they definitely shared certain um, ethnic and cultural um, elements, that they spoke a similar language, but they, they didn't consider themselves as a whole as a people. Mm. Uh, as a nation, essentially, um, um, I am. Mm, I like very much this idea because I, I've studied, a, say, something about the migration era, and I realized that indeed these perceptions were really, um, really um, underdeveloped. I mean, the, the the mentality of, let's say, a um, or a Germanic mm, king, let's say, even the term king is very... There weren't kingdoms, really, there were confederations of tribes, and there was a, a chief, so this kind of ruling was chosen as a military guide, and there, there was this this preeminent um, warlord who had that managed to, to essentially um, exalt this um, Populations last for loot, for for adventure, for f and 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 because these populations um, needed a guide during at least the the travel that happened during the migration. That is something that was necessary for the sake of organization, even if the Germans didn't like at all to be ruled by an overlord. Um, so, and in fact, did most of them, some populations eventually maintained the monarchy for certain things and reasons that we can't really talk about today. Um, others instead always rejected it, even when they settled down. Um, and and um, the, the, the idea is, um, however, that uh, they, these populations reasoned in a term of like, we are these people. I mean, if you were born in one, into this com into one of these confederations, you, your attachment was pr pr priorly to your tribe, to your clan, actually, and to the related clans that formed the tribe. Then you had this probably warlike affiliation with other tribes, so that you, ha you had your own name as a tribesman, 
and your own trait as a, um, the warrior of a, of a confederation, essentially. Uh, if you if you look uh, in my migration era playlist, you will find the um, the history of the Alamanni. Uh, I made a video about the the Alamanni, the history of a Germanic people. Then that makes you understand that these populations conceived themselves to be Swabian because that was their tribal ethnonym. Actually, also the Swabians originally had been a confederation, so it's very complicated, but partially, when, once they settled into southwestern Germany, they, um, they began to, 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 to clash with the empire. They, they, they called themselves Swabians, but the name that they used against their enemies, or internationally speaking, was the Alamanni, that is a confederational uh, and very, um, let's say, um, standard name which it means literally old men, which is a man meant in, in as warriors. So it was a pretty standard, it's a sort of war cry, mm -hmm. conceptually speaking. It's the idea, that's how we call uh, ourselves when we st stick together against some a common enemy. But we, in time of peace in our land, we are the Swabians, or, or whoever we are, tribally speaking. So um, that's essentially the, the horizon to which the, the, this Germanic mind went on. So especially the, the Germanic elites that eventually were in, in charge of, the, um, of these confederations uh, and had greater relations also for, with the Roman uh, authorities, um, um, with, with the other Germanic confederations, it probably sensed and evidently understood that the other confederations were uh, uh, dwelling in Germany, roughly, were of similar... Uh, I mean, the, 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 they probably spoke the same language within themselves. They, uh, they interacted, they, they shared many, many characteristics, definitely, but still, probably their mindset hadn't didn't manage to, to look um, the whole thing from the above and see and saying oh yeah it's as if we are a unique people uh, one thing they had in common really is that were, were the Scandinavian origins like the Germans always kept in their own sagas in their own um, epics this um, conscience that they all came from from one stock this is true but this stock was still generating different populations. So they didn't look at the stock as their, let's say, um, um, identity core. Their identity core stood around their mytholo mythology, their um, ethnogenesis, their um, foundation myths of how the gods had essentially either adopted or created them or stuff like that. And generally speaking, they began to understand that there was something in common when they began to settle into the Roman world because uh, um, it, it was actually the Romans um, and the Greeks, we can say, because the Roman Empire, towards especially the late Empire, was increasingly growing, Hellenized in 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 many ways, especially in the East, obviously. But um, the 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 idea is that um, that we have today in history is that these Germanic populations began to have a Germanic conscience because when um, they adopted the Roman idea that uh, the the Romans had of them, the Romans called them Germanic as they had called that other bunch of of, of peoples that they had conquered as Celts. Um, but as a matter of fact. Even if these guys had a lot in common, they, they didn't conceive themselves as Celts or as Germans. Mm. That's something that eventually was taken by... The Celts were now practically non-existent in the sense that, aside from the, the Celtic fringe in the British islands and some regions of uh, northern France and northern Iberia, that they, you know, that they had remained... Send the, 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 you know, the, the Roman world had kind of Romanized the Celts, the, the whole Celtic stock, let's say. While the Germans basically li uh, adopted the German term from the Romans. So, yeah, we are Germans, and they began to build up a sort of of a shared identity with their own fellow Germans, in the sense, by saying, mm, we are Germans. But that was... Um, also in this perspective, felt as something that distinguished them from the Romans and not really something that distinguished them for, for themselves. Mm. So, just to make an example, the Goths, say, or the Franks, or the Alemanni, or the Lombards, 
they definitely sensed that there was something similar, especially in relation with the Empire, but by themselves, they kept considering themselves as the Lombards, as the Franks. I mean, they, they didn't go far beyond. They, uh, they had their own common mythology, common um, common culture, but still, still mm, preparing, mm, let's say, um, it, mm, developing o it on their own. Also, in fact, the differences between these Germanic populations are pretty, pretty strong. And we must say that most of these populations seemingly also weren't really Germanic in origin. Um, it seems especially the Vandals. The Vandals today, uh, I mean, first of all, the ethnical problem is also relative during the migration era, because these populations blended so much and so heavily that what really the, the, the ethnic importance really stood in the core of their um, traditions, not in where they came from or what they what genes they had. Um, and, and in this sense, it's remarkable how this um, uh, let's say um, um, core of uh, individual traditions survived actually um, through a very long time, it was capable basically of catalyzing the absorption of many other ethnic components within the um, the original core, uh, the original group of, of the people. So it's very interesting because it shows that not just the Romans integrated other populations, but normally also the Germans integrated other populations. We think, for instance, that the Vandals today were sort of mixed between Germans and Proto-Slavs, not really um, being fully German. Relatively to the Lombards, it's been said um, that they weren't uh, really um, all Germanic in, in practice, that they had very big numbers of Sarmatians into their ranks. Same goes for the Goths. Actually, the Goths seem to have been the, um, a sort of et ethnic invention, like the Goths as a people have been somehow invented, historiographically speaking. Not that these people did not exist, but the history and the origins of the gods, actually uh, looking from their myths, from their traditions, um, seem to have been a sort of very uh, patchy um, ensemble of, um, of classical historiographical notions that have been put together um, by this population to essentially grow presentable to the uh, Roman world with which they were so much interacting, to grow actually the, the mo some of the most Romanized Germans. Um, so you understand that really the uh, identity of these populations is something extremely complex to assess in historical terms and we call them Germanic often to say because I don't know because the Germanic uh, culture however today is something you know a whole block of Europe is essentially Germanic in, in origins in language you know I mean we distinguish that to get together with the Romans um, uh, um, populations and the Slavic populations, that's essentially the, the three elements that make up the uh, European identity. And um, uh, so that we, we tend to kind of categorize this. But at that time, while these identities were actually still, uh, had yet to be formed, um, or, or however, were, were still very different from, from the ones that they are today, um, we have to be very careful ab about the names and how we are, we are really calling these these populations. So, for a, for an extremely wide quantity of historical, archaeological, and linguistical studies, uh, today we prefer to stress the fact that the term German is nothing but a classical invention that eventually was adopted by the same Germans in order to to define themselves once they entered into the Roman world. Mm. And that initially they were something extremely different, or at least that they pictured themselves as something very, very different, and on on, on much narrower bases, like tribal or, or confederative ones. Um, so another great mistake that is usually done when thinking about the Roman Germanic relations in in the late Empire is making it just a matter of warfare. Uh, why am I to say this, since <laughs> I, uh, I'm using a background picture that is uh, actually showing warfare between the Romans and the Germans. Definitely warfare was um, 
you know, especially in this moment, indeed, of the migration era, a very big part of the Roman-Germanic relations, as they were the relations of all political entities at that time. I mean, war was, we can't say, the normal dialectics between um, uh, peoples at uh, those times. Um, but it's really reductive to... Um, first of all, it's wrong to think that the Romans and the Germans were enemies by definition. Mm. Um, they weren't really. Uh, if you want to find re enemies of the Romans, look at the East, look at the Persians, because <laughs> if there were two peoples that really hated their own, each other guts, those were the Romans and the Persians. Actually, you know, um, the truth is that they were only shy and they wanted to be friends one with the other, but they were too too timid, so they, they clashed instead because they, they couldn't uh, keep their emotions in. No, I, obviously, I'm kidding, but definitely, I, I mean, obviously also the Romans and the Persians appreciated each other. They weren't. At, it's simply that they were two empires that really had their own interests and 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 view of um imperial author of, of uh, let's say of imperial ambitions that definitely ended up to clash so that was a strategical reason for which rome and persia kept fighting for ages and were mortal enemies but just for saying that with the germans it was all another thing mostly m most relation between the romans and the germans were definitely mm, pacific there were certain germanic tribes like um uh, certain Celtic tribes in the past that had been mm, historically friendly to the Romans. When I say friendly and even allies, I, I don't mean that these peoples liked um, each other much. They all wanted to preserve their own autonomy. But there were certain, mm, mm, say, aspects of their certain events that, mm, and contingencies that eventually brought them to, to grow allies in, in some form. Like the Franks, for instance, that also fought at times with the Romans were generally seen as allies. Even the Goths, in some measure, uh, uh, were conceived as um, at least privileged interlocutors by the Romans. Um, there were other populations that instead were um, irreversibly enemies of the Romans, like the, the, the Alemanni, um, that actually built up their own uh, ethnic identity as a confederation in, in anti-Roman function, in practice. The Lombards, who, who weren't really, um, the, the, that had been allies of the Romans also at times, especially uh, in the beginning when they were still in Pannonia, but that for evident reasons bordering the Romans after a, a time and settling into Italy were uh, unavoidably enemy of the Romans and never accepted any form of, um, let's say, of... Um, of Roman delegation for ruling over Italy, like I said, the Franks have done with Gaul or the Goths with Spain and Italy, uh, with Italy before the Longbirds. So there are different relations. So it's actually, the Roman-Germanic relations are pretty complicated. It would take um, a whole university class to to actually scope that properly, uh, but. Um, and there were other populations that really didn't have much to do with the Romans. Take the Anglo-Saxons, for instance, that mostly did piracy since the, 12, the second century AD, so, but they mostly they, uh, I mean, along the, the northern Gallic and British coast, um, but w however ended up in settling there in the so-called Litus Saxonicum, as the Romans had called them, but essentially what happened with Britain is that Romans went away, they left this romano britonic um, administration that had more or less to, to, to remain there and, and then the Romans in the name of Rome, but eventually the Anglo-Saxon came later and you can argue that the Anglo-Saxon didn't have much to do with Rome in the first place. Um, uh, there were Mm, also certain Germanic populations that practically didn't interact with, that they remained into Germany as well. Take the Saxons, take the Thuringians, take... Those were also mm, mm, creations eventually of the same of the same Germans in a certain measure, like the Bavarians seemingly were sort of a, of Frankish emanation, they weren't even there, it wasn't really a, a a Bavarian ethnicity, that it was a mix of 
uh, Romano, Celtic, Germanic populations that decided to form this duchy, not even a kingdom, but it's something that happened under the uh, the, the the Frankish um, in the, within the Frankish political orbit. So th there are lots of there were there were people Germanic populations that definitely disappeared. They were crushed, they were defeated, and that uh, quite interestingly, even after having dwelled um, for centuries into one central uh, area of uh, um, of, um, um, of, uh, of of Europe, decided once they were crushed, defeated, to to come back on the um, um, on the um, into Scandinavia and um, so this is very interesting because it shows how these populations actually still uh, recorded their common origin and how they felt that to be um, um, some th there had to be something Scandinavia was seen the, or the, the place of origin of all these populations um, the uh, the the idea is how also that the Romano-Germanic relations started very very early in time. If you take the Teutonic mig the Cimbrian migrations that um, caused so many troubles to the Roman Republic at the time, um, eventually they were defeated. Uh, but the the really stable relations between these populations was in. Um, in 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 post in, in Caesarian t from Caesarian times onwards, where uh, when Caesar conquered Gaul in first century BC, so they uh, he first of all subjugated the the Celts that were living in Gaul, but um, he basically created the Rhine frontier, so where the um, Romans and the Germans basically faced each other uh, for for centuries. Um, and uh, the there were actually certain warfare. There was actually some warfare along the Rhine f continuously from um, from those time onwards um, that eventually intensified from the second half of the second century A.D. as we've seen. But um, we must say that the Romano-Germanic relations along the Rhine were chiefly um, Pacific. Actually, the greater problems for the Romans were act on the Danube, um, because of the Marcomannic Confederation, that was actually a pretty powerful one, and actually the Western Germans weren't considered even as a particularly great threat, because we had this idea that they, um, the Germans were this extremely terrible thing, but Caesar a actually defeated them. And they were definitely pretty warlike populations. They were, I in Roman eyes, the, the most warlike populations that existed in terms of individual bravery and all. But definitely in terms of political and military organization, they, they weren't much of a threat because they were too weak. They still didn't organize themselves into confederations, especially on the Rhine. They were still uh, tribes. Uh, the bigger confederations had been the Swabian one that was in the northeast of Germany, actually between Germany and Poland today, and the Marcomanni that had uh, knocked out the boy from Bohemia and uh, were pretty aggressive and a very big, even kingdom considered sometimes. Think about the Marabot, their king and all. Um, and actually, the disaster of the Teutoburg forest for the Roman armies wasn't taking place because of warfare against the Western Germans, where, where the battle, the, the slaughter more or less, actually occurred. Um, that was because the Romans were pass mm, passing very uh, serenely through Western Germany because they considered it to be conquered. Actually, the Romans conquered Western Germany and they kept it subjugated for 20 years uh, or more even up to the Elbe River. The Romans conquered Germany. The problem is that um, they wanted to crush uh, the Marcomanni passing from the Rhine and from the Danube, so this this kind of pincer movement. Then eventually there was the Illyrian revolt that made the uh, invasion of of uh, the Marcomanni lands uh, aborted. And that's when, while uh, the, the Roman armies were retreating, uh, were passing through the Western Germany, that the, the Western Germans rose and, and defeated the Romans at, at the, in the Battle of the Teutoburg Force. And from there on, the Romans kind of understood, I mean, if they had wanted, they might have crushed the Germans once again. 
the problem of Germany was not much being conquered but being maintained um, because it, uh, and it wasn't really only about the nature of the Germans that was definitely very tough but as we have seen the Germans had been conquered at a point and they had even began uh, in part this on this journey on the path of romanization <laughs> let's say but when the Romans saw the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, they understood, they made some calculation. They actually thought to reconquer Germany, but they, they understood that the main problem there, uh, having entered into it, because before that they, they didn't know actually Germany how it really was, that they, they, they in order to, to maintain it, they needed a huge amount of resources in terms to create a sedentary uh, civilization. I mean, goal that they had conquered was easy to keep because it, were, it was a very wealthy land. The Celts had even managed in this sense to reach some certain forms of proto-urbanization, so it was very easy for the Romans to, to control Gaul, environmentally speaking. There were already certain um, highways, um, the land. Uh, Gaul is pretty easy to, to keep as um, geogra considering its geographic nature. Um, and it was already advanced. Germany was a, a complete mess. It was one of the most underdeveloped areas of Europe. Um, it was full of forests, of, of swamps. Um, it was extremely difficult to find the resources and the material for creating something greater than a village, essentially. So you couldn't maintain legions in there. So what the Romans did was to settle on this Rhine frontier and to um, um, to actually guard the Germans. This is also a very important concept to remember about this topic. Uh, um, the, um, the concept of frontier. People believe that when looking at the map of the Roman Empire that Usually you have this red, Ro iconic red Roman Empire with, with its borders all well defined. Uh, usually the, on books you find the progression of how these borders moved. But as a matter of fact, that it's a sort of 19th century nation state um, picturing of, of uh, um, an entity like the Roman Empire that was uh, a wholly complete, uh, a completely different thing. Um, the, um, the Roman Empire worked essentially in a very different way. Surely there were frontiers, but the frontier is not conceived as a linear border. Uh, it's more of an area of influence that um, exists, that is um, an influence that is exercised by, by a, a this or that power in terms of um, um, you know, it's military power, essentially, political influence, uh, indeed. When you look at the Rhine frontier, especially, since now we're talking about the Germans, but it worked also for other areas of the Le Roman Linus, you have to think that the Roman legions that were stationed into, um, along the Rhine weren't really there for a containment reason. I mean, it's not that there was this sort of chain, a uh, defensive chain f that ha didn't have to, to be passed because it, it, it was meant to contain the push of the Germans. Actually, before the 4th century, it's th th these Germans weren't even pushing in the first place. Uh, or at least they had been st halted pretty easily, and after that, for the Terence reason, th they hadn't tried it anymore. There were small-scale raids and nothing else, like Brigand Age, or maybe something greater, but nothing that could really compromise the, um, the Roman um, prisons in, in, along the Rhine. Actually, the, the, the Rhine line was meant to control both Gaul and Germany. So it's as if Germany had been, however, even if the, there weren't physically Romans in there, it had been part of the Empire because those legions served to control both the Gallic populations and the Germanic populations. The Gauls didn't rebel, if not once, but it was really, you know, a small thing. But the idea if that is that if those legions had not remained in there, definitely the, the populations, even of Gaul, not just of Germany, would have r risen up and, you know, mm, mm, uh, become independent once again.
So the Roman pre that's why it's important to stress on this, because actually the Roman presence basically was a sort of pacificatory uh, deterrent uh, presence, and not, not much more. So uh, you have to think as a sort of, uh, and the Romans themselves didn't believe at of, of the Limes as a sort of uh, of of um, you know place outside of which there was Rome uh, in, uh, inside of which there was Rome and outside of which was uh, the barbarians at all they b simply believed that was this sort of m monumentum um, which is uh, a term that um, uh, it, it has a very um, peculiar etymological meaning, but in this sense, uh, and also certain semantic shading, but let's say that in this sense it's it's a sort, I don't know how to translate that properly in English, but it is a sort of um, um, of munition, mm, you know, the idea that you are preserved I in a certain sense, that you keep there in order to present a, 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 a bulwark. Um, 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 a, um, a sort of um, um, of presence that is put in there to control all around, and that's how the Romans really saw the thing. So that they had this sort of thermometer for which they couldn't understand which people was about to create some disorder and how to act on that politically or militarily and to, to keep it at bay. Because all the Romans cared about was to keep uh, the area pacified so they, they could take uh, the taxes for and the tolls from the from the from trade. That's the only thing. When when there is war there is no trade, so it's also loss in economical terms um in many ways. Um so um these two worlds um, that have been said, the Roman and Germanic ones, actually were um, quite more interconnected than we can imagine. The Romans and Germans traded extensively. They, uh, we, we know of Roman traders into into the Baltic Sea, um, I into Germany. Uh, the Germans had also pretty extensive mm, trade nets. I mean, from the coast of Norway, that there were people mm, trading uh, up to the uh, Upper Rhine through 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 the through the river. Um, there was this extensive. W we found um, actually uh, a pretty extensive amount of. Uh, um of roman um even uh, of the of, of presence of roman artifacts and goods um let's say from the rhine to the urals and uh, this is really how it was the, the real thing and actually that happened not much because of the romans actually mm, uh, reaching up to there physically but really the, the this whole world that gravitated around the empire that important these goods and and knew about Rome, so that maybe Rome didn't know about the guys dwelling in the Urals, but th the guys dwelling in the Ru Urals definitely knew about the Romans, as they knew about China, probably uh, <coughs> already at that distance. Um, so um, this is very interesting because it shows that it's as if the Romans and the Germans had been very close since a very early age. Um, and uh, the actual closeness of the Romans to the Germans is out there in many other ways. Because, first of all, the Romans, uh, as we know, uh, hired lots of Germans since um, in, in the Roman army uh, since a very early age, like in, even in the Gallic War of Caesar. First thing Caesar does is um, noticing that the Germanic cavalry was, uh, cavalrymen were pretty good. They didn't have good horses, though, because Germany was um, sort of an infamous land to 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 for any kind of um, breeding and economical activity in, in a broader sense. So he basically took even the the, the horses of the Roman cavalry, the Roman knights, and, and gave them to the Germans, that, however, were much more individually skilled, and and thanks to German cavalry, uh, won many many clashes against the Gauls. Um, the, uh, the Germans were enrolled into, into Augustus' bodyguard. The idea of enrolling these guys, first of all, the Germans seem to have been relatively taller than, than the Romans. This is also a thing that the Romans like to stress because they, they, they didn't have um, um, body complexes <laughs> at all. But the truth is that really between an Italic um, 
and, and a German, there weren't at the time excess, an excessive um, difference in height, um, if not of a few inches practically. Um, but the Romans liked to emphasize that, al that although being shorter, uh, they uh, they had managed to prevail against these populations like the Celts and the Germans that they were stereotypically depicted as a red, uh, fair-haired, as very tall and all. Definitely they were tall, they were big guys and all. Um, this had happened prevalently because the, the tougher climate of the Nord had selected populations, um, and say tougher, tougher, bigger organisms, <laughs> let's say, the, um, compared to, to the warm Mediterranean. But there wasn't, I mean, there were all Indo-Europeans, there weren't these huge ethnic differences at that time. Um, but generally speaking, these guys were taller, stronger, um, they had a very individual uh, training skill, and they had a, a relatively poor collective training because they didn't have the, the, uh, the state like the Romans had that could impose that discipline on legionaries and making them this extremely efficient military machine on on the field, but uh, individually speaking, they were tough, robust, and uh, very apt at fighting. And, and obviously, the Romans went selecting the, the toughest ones, definitely not <laughs> the weakest ones for the imperial bodyguard. And plus, the idea was that the, um, as it happens many times in history, that by hiring uh, a foreign mercenary, uh, um, um, a foreign that essentially has no affiliation to the local political intrigues, you are safeguarded because that guy receives your pay. And, and he's tied essentially to you, and nobody else cares about him. Um, and therefore, it doesn't intrigue, which is also a bit an oversimplification because these things kept, kept happening. But this was also a way for the Germanic elites that at the time of Augustus were within the empire, as we've said, because Germany had been conquered before uh, Teutoburg. Um, to actually grow close to the Romans. Like if you look at um, Hermann, Arminius, um, the, the guy who defeated, um, uh, destroyed the, the Roman legions at, 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 at Tudorburg Forest. Um, he actually had a brother. There was a, 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 an extreme. Uh, first of all, he had been raised in Rome, and he had been faithful to the Roman. He was considered faithful ally. And even when he betrayed, he he betrayed from the Roman side, and the, the were still part of his family, including his brother, was, was uh, uh, telling the truth, uh, uh, he said a very strong, uh, was extremely loyal to Rome. Um, he was a Roman soldier, essentially, and, and he hated his, his brother guts because of what he had done. Uh, so this idea that the Germanic elites were in contact with Romans, were strengths of trade, were um, bodies of Germans enrolled into the Roman army, is, was something normal normal administration and, telling the truth, along the Rhine frontier there were Roman colonies that had been founded thanks to the, the, um, the Germanic element, like the Ubi, the Ubians, a very famous Germanic um, um, tribe, or at least supposedly Germanic because that was a frontier area that were mixed with the Celts, but it seemed that they thought of them to be Germanic, founded the um, uh, this this community uh, um, uh, that um, was um, um, was considered as one of the most brilliant um, uh, a exam uh, example of um, um, of um, the integration of the uh, of the Romans and the um, this place called initially Ara. Ubiorum, eventually known as Colonia Claudia Ara Agrippinensum, or Colonia Agrippina, would be um, actually uh, nothing that a uh, uh, the, the the modern German city of Cologne, hmm? one of the most important cities, actually, also historically speaking, in in Germany. Um, that was founded by the Romans and had been uh, and, and, and grown thanks to the participation to the Roman public life of the Germans. And this was daily business, like this was happening in Gaul uh, with the, Germ uh, the, the Celtic um, aristocracies that got progressively Romanized and eventually participating to the rule of the cities and um, rising to, to the Senate and all. Um, and, and the Ubians, as Germans, were extremely proud, both being of German 
uh, origin and being Germans actually and remaining German and being faithful Roman citizens so this was the greatness of Rome um, the, the greatest the greatness of saying it doesn't matter where you are from how you look like what language you speak what customs you have as long as you participate to the Roman state you're a Roman citizen and you can't keep your own traditions and this worked as well with the Germans so the idea that the Germans didn't want to be integrated that uh, you know I don't know there is this stupid idea today that Germans that were this kind of destroyers of Rome because the Rome was was corrupt, it was bad, uh, the, the Germans were cool, yeah, you know, all of that. It's completely false. Um, it's complete, um, utter rubbish. The, the Germans actually greatly admired the Romans and and the Romano Germanic history in our world that gave uh, rise eventually to our modern identities is based essentially on the integration between Romans and Germans in a very successful way by the way. This tanks to, and, and this doesn't exclude warfare, doesn't exclude um, cultural differences, doesn't exclude hate, because you cannot tell these stories without without explaining how the reasons why a person can kill another. I, it's obvious that the, the Romans and the Germans hated themselves when they fought on a battlefield, but it, it, it was because those Germans had rebelled to Rome and there were many, many other political implications. It wasn't really because there were Germans and there were Romans, okay? So, um, think about it if you've never done it, but I think today these are pretty um, widespread, um, pretty ex it's pretty accessible knowledge. Uh, I mean, it, it's how really we teach history today and it's really the most uh, refined historiographical interpretation and then that we can we can uh, we can find um, so there had been actually even a successful integration of Germans up to that point nobody had even cared I mean the Germans were just one of the populations that existed they had nothing special in themselves all the populations were characterized in that way the Germans were considered as more warlike as more courageous and all that you know the, what, what really the, the Romans cared about was um, <laughs> ruling um, over their empire, so that they wrote extensively about the Germans, probably even more telling the truth than other populations. Um, the Romans had a very, um, very um, great ethnographic interest towards the Germans, from Caesar to Tacitus, and w we all know about this. Um, the real problem began really in the second half of the 4th century because up to that point, as we were saying, there had been very an, even very heavy German uh, raids on, on the empire. Some of them had reached up to Italy. Uh, Rome had been refortified by the Emperor Aurelian in the second half of the 3rd century BC because there were Germanic populations that could arrive even up to there. Um, but essentially, when they finished the raid, they came back home because they had no way to occupy the Roman soil for much longer. What happened in fourth century, and that's where the video about the, uh, the Huns and the migration era uh, turns out to be useful, there is a very different problem because the Huns basically arriving from, the, from Asia um, pushed all these um, Germanic and I Iranic civil um, populations. When I say Iranic, I don't mean modern Iran. I mean, modern Iran is given the name from these populations in turn that were uh, from the steppes, the Eurasian, like the Ukraine and places like those. There were actually the Sarmatians, the Shitsins. These were the Iranian peoples, or Iranic peoples, as you want to call them. They were blonde, blue eyed, they were Indo European as well. So they, um, the, the Huns, they were pretty, um, they were actually, they had a, a, a more advanced military culture than Germans, um, kind of arrived in Europe and were able to subject all these populations to, to their own will. Parts of them, however, didn't want to stay under the Huns and, and even before their arrival were beginning to push into at the Roman borders. So we said the Ro Romans uh, um, lacked numbers of manpower uh, of, of men for the army mm, they couldn't control this um, border that was also something pretty permeable and it had always been permeable uh, there wasn't really a line from which you said these guys cannot pass there were certain fortifications that however had a mainly tactical use N they weren't of strategic um, 
um, use if not for supporting the main uh, defense and the main uh, or the main offense that was carried out by the immobile army that was really what made the, the thing done but I mean fortifications were passed were passable they couldn't stop a wall people you could halt maybe a people through the fortifications but only if you had men guarding them so practically um, the 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 Germans were uh, desperate about passing because, um, as we know, they um, uh, they didn't have a proper um, they had, they didn't really have any other chance at that point. But being subjugated by the Huns, and the Huns meant simply that there were mm, uh, new rulers that uh, also had to eat and to dwell in their in in the pastures and. In this sense, someone had to get out. So there is the, the famous um, event of the Battle of Adrianople that was one of the um, probably more under overestimated defeats of the Roman army in history. I mean, there were much more disastrous Roman defeats in in, in Roman history. However, the the uh, the, the Aust um, sorry the Visigoths. Um, the gods were split into um, two branches. The, the Visigoths were these populations that to that time had dwelled roughly into today's Romania. And the Ostrogoths were instead in their Ukrainian steppes and they eventually came to be subject to the Huns so that eventually the Visigoths entered after Battle of Adrianople into the Roman Empire and at Battle of the Catalonian Fields you, you find the, the Visigoths fighting um, alongside the Romans <laughs> And the uh, and the Ostrogoths fighting alongside the Huns. By the way, the, the 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 Huns highly respected the Ostrogoths, and and the Ostrogoths also got pretty um, uh, influenced by Hunnic warfare. They grew a very strong cavalry, seemingly, but also probably because they were mixed with Sarmatians that were already horse riding peoples and all. So basically, with Adrianople, what happens is that uh, a world people that is the Visigoths, enters into uh, the Roman Empire as a whole block. So not having split up into many uh, little communities and eventually scattered all the corners of the empire like the Romans used to do in order to assimilate these populations, but really the remaining uh, um, sort of autonomous political un uh, entity within the Roman Empire. Actually, um, the the defeat of Adrianople doesn't imply that the gods even here had basically decided to invade empire for for raiding it, or th they just wanted to have new land to settle to escape the Huns, and this was done was accorded by the Roman authorities. Um, there was also the I mean Theodosius was the great. Um, um, a reorderer of the empire. Actually, the whole imperial propaganda at the time was about the fact that the gods, so fierce and uh, and warlike, had been Romanized and now dwelling into the empire together with the Romans. Because objectively, the Romans managed to um, engage the gods into their own politics and military affair. Actually, the gods fought very bloodily for the Romans um, in uh, in many areas of the empire. So they paid their toll. I mean, they earned their space in the empire. Uh, however, they remained this nucleus that couldn't be um, controlled very well. Now we can't make all the story of Alaricus of Silicon. Yeah, they arrived to, to sack Rome and all, and they shifted essentially, eventually into um, into southern Gaul initially, and they settled there. Um, the western part of the half of the empire was much less populated and already growing weaker than the eastern one. So um, the, the Western Roman, at this time the empire was already split into these two administrative repartitions. Actually the, 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 empire, the Roman Empire, there the, the have never been two Roman Empires. When you say Western and Eastern Roman Empire, you, you don't have to think that, yeah, there were two different entities in the sense that they, they had a different government, a different society, they, they also spoke different languages to a certain extent. Um, so there were something different, but from a formal institutional point of view, the empire has always remained one. These were essentially only two administrative repartitions that had a, um, in this sense, just a um, temporary nature, and it had occurred just to govern better the empire. I mean, at a certain point, the empire had been splitting also into four under the uh, Diocletian. Uh, 
in all before Constantine. So, but um, just to make you understand that, however, the West was the one that had more uh, had less resources compared to the East at that point. That um, and in this sense, the, the the even the Germans spotted the fact that that area was weaker. Um, so the Goths uh, were essentially the first ones, eventually even to Romanize in this sense, because their settlement into the imperial lands implied that they got Romanized. Also, for a very simple reason, they were, they were really a few. When we talk about these uh, populations, we say as if the Roman Empire had grown weaker demographically and these populations hadn't, had, hadn't suffered of anything. Actually, it was the, the, the same for them as well. I mean, there were a very few. Um, this migration, mm, migrations had also caused an attrition um, that had made them lose energies, manpower as well. The environmental factors were the ones for everyone. Actually, the places where they came from was, uh, was were even worse, environmentally speaking, than the ones in the empire. And when they settled in the empire, we're talking about a few um, tens of thousands of of of, um, um, of I'd say male adults probably um, that made up the warrior class. So we can imagine that they reached up never probably more than than one hundred thousand, which is a huge estimate. Telling the truth, it's really the the extreme estimate. The places where they settled in the empire were populated by millions. So even the the impact of these populations was relatively um, relatively mm, mm, few in practice, um, and especially these populations, in order to to live within the imperial borders, they had necessarily to mix with the local populations to to form bonds with the local aristocracies to do. So, how did this happen practically? So. With the uh, Visigoths, in spite of all the dramatic aspects of the, their migration, the defeat of Adrianople and all, the, the Visigoths, uh, the Romans had decided to, to basically make the Goths settling in Thrace. Um, this is also interesting because Thrace was, um, you know, what the Romans really cared about was in settling these populations in the less populated areas of the empire. The ones that were wealthier, generally speaking, <laughs> were not easily given up. And so the idea is, was to form this sort of um, shield um, by settling the Germans um, alongside the frontier in order to, to stop even the other, uh, the other migrations. Because once that, that these gods had conquered their own land, they surely didn't want to give it up to other guys knocking at the, at the door. So uh, the the gods, as we've seen, were settled in the seventies um, of the fourth century, um, and the relation, the say institutional relation that the Roman Empire um, uh, uh, enabled with them was the so-called federatio. So we were say, talking about before it's the so-called alliance, um, and um, and and this was used as a system of containment mm, of this pressure exercised by uh, the other Germans on the frontiers. Um, so turning even Germans against Germans in a certain measure. Now it's interesting in here also we, we have all the um, Roman perspective of the Federatio, meaning that um, the Romans still... Uh, the Federatio was a very ancient thing, as we were saying. It was usually based on a mutual agreement. Mm, this was the main reason. Um, actually, the Romans had developed the Federatio in their expansion in the Mediterranean, also um, creating um, 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 sort of a um, uh, unappellable type of alliance that was a forced one, uh, the Fedus Iniquus, so w which means the um, unequal, literally, um, so unfair um, a pact that was essentially an alliance uh, as a, a pact imposed on those populations that had been kind of raised to the ground and that couldn't and, and Romans took advantage of that so imposing them to serve into the Roman army to tell what they they wanted and to do and, and all um, uh, what they wanted them to do and etc um, 
we, in, in to this later phase, the, this federatio was seen from the German side, even, even though we don't have many sources from the, the German perspective, as a sort of a mutual agreement. And because the Germans didn't conceive themselves as put there by the Romans, and they obviously understood that it was like that, because if the Romans had wanted, they could have wiped them out. Uh, with great effort, but it, it was still a danger. I mean, these peoples knew that they had got their land, but they had to behave <laughs> in a certain sense, not cr to create further attrition. But, but from, from the Germanic point of view, from the Germanic perspective, the Germans were always free. I mean, they were full um, contractors in, the, in this alliance. They didn't... Um, they, they did that um, freely, without uh, coherence, um, um, uh, coercion, um, they felt themselves as the freemen that had won their um, their mm, prize with arms, and th this was really a Germanic mentality. The Romans were were very different. Naturally, they they thought to be still the masters of the situation. So these are also parts of the cultural misunderstandings that definitely brought to warfare to to complicate situation. But it's not really about culture; it's really that uh, about politics and and military. I mean, th there are certain. It doesn't matter which populations are interacting. Um, politics and war are always the same. They, they, they always function in the same uh, for the, with the same rules. Let's say. Um, so the um there was also another form of um um mm, uh, let's say um, another system through which the the Germans were practically settled because one thing was the federatio was act the, the pact proper but there were also the conditions of exploitment of the land sometimes federatio and hospitality and, and and this name is the hospitalitas so the uh, hospitality literally in latin so the federatio and the hospitalitas uh, didn't necessarily went uh, along together um, i mean mm, together um, there could be either just the federatio or either just the hospitalitas or both or known because certain <laughs> Germans eventually settled into the Roman borders without asking for permission in practice. Even though it, 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 it uh, I mean, at least the major peoples still, mm, Germanic people still so profitable as um, you know to intervene. Um, I mean, to to interact with the Romans to gain this formal uh, sanction of their settlement because that was pretty precious and. Uh, you couldn't really enter into 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 that system and not caring about the Roman Empire because that was still the major power that could reconquer everything theoretically from a moment to another. So you had to be ready at least to have established a certain kind of relation with with this entity. So uh, the hospitalitas, the hospitality. Um, was um, essentially a system um, according to which the um, the Romans entrusted to the new settlers, uh, to the newcomers, one third or even more sometimes of the lands and or or the products of a certain region, in exchange of um, fidelity, fealty essentially, and of the uh, obviously of the feudal. Um, uh, excuse me, <laughs> not feudal, but the military um, help to the empire, um, support to the empire, so with uh, Germanic uh, troops. I said feudal uh, with a lapsus because indeed this is something similar to the um, feudal system. I, I mean, in the feudal system you have the king that says, okay, I entrust you this land um, to to provide me troops for, for fighting alongside with me. But this is what the Romans were already doing, so this was a moment to which even society was slowly transforming into what we call as the medieval one. There was nothing like that, obviously, but there are certain um, dynamics that start happening from this time. And this is interesting because here it's not just about the lands, as we've said, but also the products of the land. Because the Roman system, uh, supply system that worked mainly for the army, but at this time also for supplying the, the major cities, uh, the so-called annona in Latin, uh, was at this point uh, become in, in in the general crisis of the ancient world the um, I mean payment in nature was had become the main form of payment 
instead than gold. So sometimes these um, natural goods, natural products were quantified as sort of revenue, or sort of salary, we can say, uh, uh, rather than using gold, um, precious metals, coins and all. Um, so, um, obviously the Romans tended to settle uh, the, um, the Germans, as we have said, in those areas that were largely unpopulated. We are told that when the Franks settled along the Rhine, even along Cologne that we discussed before, practically mm, almost no one had remained there, because between the mm, wars, the, the epidemics, the climate change, whatever you want to put in, as far, th th those r regions went unpopulated, and believe me, in the ancient world, is, it was pretty easy to uh, to depopulate an area, mm. um, because the people were <laughs> less, um, and the economy couldn't sustain more than much. So it was um, it was a quite delicate equilibrium that even when the Germans settled into these lands, they basically starved most of the times. Um, so it wasn't even this huge deal, it's not that the Romans were surrendering this great um, fertile areas of their empire, which also tells you, by the way, in this sense, how they were capable still of controlling most of their major um, productive centers, that uh, they, uh, especially towards the late empire, they were putting great care in managing and in, in, in administering um, um, always in a more centralized fashion. And this time, for instance, the Romans take back all the uh, uh, legionary uh, armories, um, I mean, the, the, um, the so-called fabrica uh, for product uh, producing the um, uh, weaponry and, and, and armor uh, close to the Mediterranean, so the, the core of the empire is uh, very often in the cities that were surrounded by walls and all. So uh, there is the kind of a new Roman organization, uh, strategical organization that implies um, uh, an increased number of fortifications, a, uh, a much more uh, direct control of, of the state on the, um, on the communities, um, uh, cities, or oh, certain, certain cities were also definitely the target of the barbarians because um, um, they were the places where, where the Romans were accumulating their wealth, so there were certain cities that um, were left behind in favor of others that instead were uh, more um, uh, conveniently fortified and all. If you think about Constantinople, that was refounded from the ancient Greek and later Roman city of the Bosphorus, that was relatively small. At this time, Constantinople is being built as a huge capital. Think about the Theodosian walls that are this magnificent um, fortification system that uh, basically defended uh, successfully the city for, for one millennium. Um, and, um, you know, lots of changes. Um, ultimately, for um, that, that, that witnessed the ability of the Romans this time, to st especially in, in the East, to keep out the Germans from... And, and that because in the East there were the resources. In the West, as we said, things were growing grimmer. Um, the um, the hospitalitas was the the system that was used for settling the Franks and the Alamanni on the Rhine, for instance. Um, the um, with the with task of um, let's say uh, repelled the other Germans that pressed on uh, beyond the the, the limits. So um, it was very simple like this, but. There was a certain point, an avalanche, that really the Romans couldn't uh, couldn't stop anymore because they were dealing both with the um, with the Goths uh, in the south, in Italy, and in Greece, um, and and also the the Huns were arriving essentially, um, and it, it's very famous that in the um, in the night of December the thirty first of four hundred o six over the frozen Rhine. Uh, uh, here, yes, a, a real human uh, tide uh, passed, um, in spite of the resistance opposed by the Franks and the Alamanni, um, through the uh, Roman limits, um, 
eventually spreading into different directions within within the west uh, western western half of the empire at this point even the franks seeing that everybody was passing of these huge populations the, the, the vandals the islands the swadians the burgundians and all they also shifted a little bit <laughs> westwards because the roman authority there basically had collapsed and they uh, even if they were allies of the roman state they 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 took their advantage to, to seize their own part of the cake. Um, so, and by the way, the fact that the Romans had abandoned Gaul uh, at this time in 410, they they also abandoned Britain. Gaul was wasn't really abandoned in in, in, uh, in full, but it still was unguarded because of the wars that they were waging elsewhere. So, um, those things were really calculated. Um, but they brought to reversible disasters, like the crossing of 406 uh, was really the um, point of non-return, at least for the Roman control over the, uh, uh, let's say, central European um, regions. Definitely the western half of the empire kept its influence in, in Italy, into southern Gaul, into Spain, into Africa. And actually, I think that I'm one of those people who believes that Western half of the Roman Empire could have um, actually survived, um, historically speaking, if, and there were mm, actually there, there were a few events that triggered the fall of the Western half. Surely, all these um, weakening um, had reduced the imperial. Um, uh, the, the the Western Roman um, chances of recovering everything, but definitely if, if you know certain event. Now we can't talk about this, but let's just say that the the Roman state in the West still survived in a certain form. And people like to say, "Oh yes, it had to fall, like the West was was doomed." No, it wasn't really. Also because uh, everybody, you know, if the West was in, in very dear conditions, so uh, were the Visigoths, so were many other populations that were dwelling in there. So it was really an, env an environmental problem. It was just to see who had to, to win this. The key thing was the the um, uh, the Vandals in Africa, because if at the end of the 5th century the Vandals have been wiped out from Africa, which uh, thanks to the Byzantine, uh, uh, <laughs> the Eastern Roman fleet, could have been achieved, the West could have survived. At least up to the Arab invasions, uh, Africa could have been kept, easily could have kept feeding Rome and Italy, generally speaking, uh, Ravenna at that point, because Rome was uh, already not anymore the capital, if not... Um, and namely, um, and um, but let's say the four four hundred of six was really a very meaningful moment in history, because um, greater part of the western provinces of the empire were occupied by other lands. Um, so the the Burgundians um, they uh, occupied the essentially central southern. Uh, goal in in the western part. Um, the um, the Franks and the Alamanni were finally managed in 409 basically to get rid of the others because because basically they saw that um, the latter saw that the um, that there were other lands around so even remaining in Gaul was not extremely is, is it was getting too crowded in practice. Uh, there wasn't room for anyone. So these um, populations crossed the Pyrenees and they invested the Iberian Peninsula. Notice that Italy still existed, so meaning that at least in there there was a mm, there was still the bulk of the mm, Western Roman forces that could not just defend but also eventually launch attacks on as it would happen into Spain into uh, um, into Gaul, etc. Um, the, the Swabians, at least part of the Swabians, because some of them had remained in Germany, including the Alamanni that were uh, Swabian in origin, but mm, a consistent group of Swabian um, entered Spain and settled in today's um, territories of Galicia. Galicia is a, um, a region in, um, in the north of, of Spain. 
So the Swabians dwelled in there, and actually the um, the Visigoths, um, um, the um, uh, the, v the Visigoths eventually also went into Spain they created the larger kingdom and they managed to, to subdue them in a certain fashion but, but in practice the, the Swabians remained pretty autonomous in, in, in there um, the Alans that were this uh, they weren't really Germans seemingly were this mix were mostly of Iranic uh, origin settled in today's uh, Portugal so in Lusitania, in the Roman Lusitania and uh, while the Vandals settled in the central and southern part of the Iberian Peninsula and from there eventually they, they moved uh, to, to Africa where they created their, their uh, kingdom um, there was a, a pretty interesting one, we will discuss about the Vandals one day they, they weren't at all the Vandals that we describe that was um, a, prejud a prejudice, uh, also not really drawn because of their political military behaviors, but mostly because they were Aryans, and therefore the papal historiography bothered them because they, I mean, um, wrote that they were bad, while the Catholic, the one who had to convert it to c Catholicism, were were good. <laughs> well, there weren't many that actually had converted to Catholicism at that point. Um, the but all of these peoples ev eventually were pressed by the Visigoths that um, because of events that happened in in Gaul in Spain we, we can't talk about this now eventually entered into into the Iberian Peninsula and created their large kingdom in in Spain uh, it wasn't all this great strength telling the truth and they uh, eventually they even lost southern Fra uh, southern Gaul to to the Franks. But um, say that the Imperial Peninsula came to dwell these populations. The islands pretty much mixed uh, to to local populations. The Swabians as well, but at least they remained something a bit more active, politically speaking, into later early medieval times in respects to the Visigoths. But generally speaking, even Visigoths and everyone eventually melted with the Roman aristocracies. So very long video, <sighs> too long video. My God. Uh, this was just an introduction, but I hope it was helpful enough. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel to receive further news about my contents if you're interested. For now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye!